Um, hello and welcome to my presentation, um, Continuous State Modeling for Statistical Spectral Synthesis. My name is Tim Treigrund and I will be presenting for you today. Um, this presentation is about introducing a novel approach of statistical spectral modeling for capturing micro, micro fluctuations with morphing capabilities. First, I'm going to give a short uh, introduction to sinusoidal modeling, which you probably all know, and present our analysis setup. Then I'm going to talk about why microfluctuations can be important for synthesis results. And after that, I'm going to through the preceding model, discrete state synthesis, its way of functioning and shortcomings. And finally, I'm going to introduce our uh, new model, continuous state modeling, and its features. So, as most of you will be already familiar with uh, the topic of spectral modeling, I will mention it only briefly. Spectral modeling is one of the main groups of audio synthesis, audio synthesis techniques. Um, here, sound is analyzed as consisting of tonal and noise-like content. And for our continuous state modeling, we will be using only the sinusoidal modeling as the basis to model the tonal content. To be more specific, we are using the um, harmonic model, which sums up individual sinusoids with time-varying amplitudes, whose frequencies are um, integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. However, the main goal of this work is to introduce a way of capturing, uh, of modeling microfluctuations um, of the amplitude and the frequency of partials. An implementation into the model can be seen uh, with the parameters shimmer, S of R, and jitter, J of R, in the second equation. As input for the analysis, we use the TU node violence sample library. It consists of 336 single sound items as well as 344 two node items and solo phrases um, with the single sound item spanning 84 individual pitches across four different dynamics from pianissimo over mezzo piano to fortissimo. Um, the library also contains timestamps for segmentation of the sound items into attack, release, and sustain phases. For the examples used in this presentation, we will use only the sustain part of sound item 96, which is a G4 in fortissimo, which sounds like this. That's an original example from the uh, library. All right. And uh, the input sounds, as well as the resynthesized re output from our model, were analyzed using the spectrum modeling synthesis tools uh, by Sarah, in short, uh, SMS tools. And there's also an example where we've analyzed the input sound using the uh, harmonic model from that toolkit which is this one. Sounds pretty similar. And... Okay. Um, here we can see the result of the analysis of the example input sound. Input sounds were analyzed using the harmonic model of the SMS tools, and the parameters uh, for the SMS tools are seen on the left side. We're using a Blackman analysis window with a window size of 1,201 and an FFT size of 2,048. Uh, our magnitude threshold of spectral peaks is minus 110 decibels. I think I will skip over uh, most of this. Um, just know that the frequency F0 refers to the fundamental frequency that we contained in the uh, violin sound library. So we knew that beforehand so we could prepare our searching range. Um, in the figures, we can see that the fluctuations in the partial trajectories are present for frequency trajectories as well as for amplitude trajectories. So, an important question is, uh, why do we need to model these microfluctuations? There is a lot of evidence that suggests that these fluctuations contribute to the individual timbre of an instrument, besides the spectral envelope, and are essential for the perceived sound quality of synthesis results. And the terms shimmer and jitter are used to define amplitude and frequency fluctuations, with shimmer describing amplitude fluctuations and jitter the frequency fluctuations. They are acoustic uh, uh, characteristics used frequently in speech processing, and here they refer to amplitude and frequency perturbations in partials. On a side note, in voice processing literature, jitter is used only for perturbations of the fundamental frequency, but here we're using it anyways. Okay, oops, sorry. 
Um, there are different ways of modeling, of modeling fluctuations in sound parameters. In this part of the presentation, I will be uh, introducing the discrete state modeling use of, using Markov chains. It is, as I said, the predecessor to our continuous state modeling and serves as preliminary work. Here we can see an excerpt from a single frequency trajectory of the fundamental frequency of sound item 96. And as we can see, uh, jitter is clearly visible. The next step in the process of discrete state modeling is the quantization of the trajectory. This works in the same way for frequency and amplitude trajectories alike. Here we have a quantized excerpt from uh, the last slide. In discrete state modeling, we have used 21 equidistant states. These quantization steps are used as states in a Markov chain, which is a sequence of states in which the probability of each following state is dependent on the previous state. So what we are doing here is going through the trajectory one state at a time and counting incidences for each state following each other. For example, if our first state is state number one and our second state is state number two, um, we will increase the counter of state two following state one. And we'll write that down in a 21 by 21 matrix. And after going through all the states within a trajectory, we can calculate the probabilities from these occurrences. Uh, this was the part of, uh, this was the state of the project when I started. We count transition probabilities from each quantization step and store them in a matrix, which you can see in this picture. For each state i, there is a probability mass function containing the probabilities of the amplitude of the next state. You can see that for the state i equals 1, uh, the probability mass function is condensed on the left side of the figure and the probability that the state following i equals 1 has an amplitude of a minimum is about 0.3. This captures the distribution properties and spectral properties. However, this also has drawbacks, as the process needed to draw random samples from this distribution, the process called inverse transform sampling, is computationally expensive, and it's a restrictive process too, which means that you cannot influence these distributions without reanalyzing your input material. So now on to uh, continuous state modeling. Uh, one possible way of removing these uh, drawbacks is uh, to parameterize a simple function in order to draw random samples from a distribution. And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce an approach of creating a skew normal distribution to that end. A random variable with a skew normal distribution can be produced using the following approach, which was described in this form by Hense. Here you have two independent standard normal, standard normal random variables, u and v. And these are used to produce a random variable uh, z of theta, which has the skew normal distribution with the par parameter theta being the skew. What's really great about this is that for a theta equals zero, this defaults to a regular standard normal distribution. You can easily see it by uh, putting in theta equals zero for the scaling factors in front of the random variables, and you'll be left with z of theta equals v, which is a standard normal random variable. So this is what that looks like. We have two examples, one standard normal distribution on the left side and one skew normal distribution on the right side. Both have their location parameter set at zero, which is the mean for the standard normal distribution, and the scale parameter set to one. You can see that for a theta equals three, the probability density of the skew normal distribution leans over more to the right side, which makes it more likely that the next parameter drawn from this distribution will be on the right side. And here's why that is important. Um, the probability mass function we had in the discrete state modeling can be substituted by a parameterized probability density function. Here we are using the current state of the system, f1 of n, as the location parameter, and a scale set to 0.01, and we have different skewness parameters for each of these states. They're ranging from minus 1 on the right side to plus 1 on the left side. This is, in fact, a continuous function, and we only slice through it at regular intervals of, at certain points of f1 of n. And here we can see the process of producing a random trajectory from the parameterized probability density function. We are starting at the mean parameter state at uh, value 0, that's the small red box at uh, time stop 1, and you can see the PDF function above it. Um, we're in the, for the next step, we're drawing a random variable from this distribution, 
which is the red box in time state uh, one, which has its own um, PDF distribution. You can see that it's more skewed to the left side, which stochastically leads our trajectory to go back into the middle again. Yeah, and we can do that again, and we'll end up maybe to the left side, maybe to the right side, more likely to the left, and we have a new uh, PDF which leans even more to uh, the left. All right, um, now I have prepared some samples that have been created using this method. One example is designed to be as close to the original as possible. The other two should uh, exaggerate either uh, shimmer or jitter, uh, also either amplitude fluctuations or frequency fluctuations. And the last one is an example of uh, morphing from a stable and more stale timbre to a timbre with more pronounced fluctuations. So this is our um, first one. Let me play it first. So, yeah, this is the uh, frequency trajectory plot and the amplitude trajectory plot of the first example. Um, you can see that both trajectories are more stable-ish. Um, you can see that there are pronounced fluctuations in the upper partials of the frequency trajectories, and you can see that for uh, the first 10 partials on the right side, they, are, um, they have relatively stable uh, trajectories comparable to uh, the input example that we saw already. So we now have the next one, which is this one. So I think you can hear a difference um, on the speaker system. Um, in case you haven't, there is also uh, these plots available again. And comparing it with the normal one, you can see that the frequency trajectories are more pronounced in uh, fluctuations, although the amplitude trajectories are mostly in, in, a, in the same range as the normal one, the normal example. All right, um, then we have an example with more shimmer, which is this one. And as you can see in these plots, uh, there is really a lot going on in the amplitude trajectories. They are all over the place, which in turn leads to the frequency trajectories, especially for the higher partials not being tracked as properly, and that's why we have those um, incisions in um, the plot. And one last example is a morphing example where we are just moving from no fluctuations at all to very pronounced fluctuations, and I'll just play that one. It took a while, but we definitely went somewhere. Um, so, Okay, as you've heard, the system is capable of producing sounds with different stochastic characteristics and is also able to morph between them. However, it is only a proof of concept as, at, at this point um, as the parameters used in this model are tuned heuristically by, by ear, <laughs> mostly, and the current application does not produce sounds in real time. Um, as it is only uses sinusoidal modeling at this point, we're also neglecting the uh, stochastic, the, the noise-like content of uh, the initial sounds. And as an outlook, uh, these parameters could be calculated either by Gaussian estimation, um, or of course one could use uh, white noise too to excite, excite parameter trajectories to create similar results. However, once the analytic parameter tuning um, is implemented, our model uh, could contain the char characteristic properties of the input sounds. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Yes, there is a question yeah. over there. Yeah. Go. <laughs> 
Thank you. I was wondering about um, the, the model you used to, for the perturbation of the frequencies and the amplitudes. Um, how natural, like did you compare with recordings of, of sounds to see if it captures the variations in recordings of instruments? Um, a good question. Uh, we haven't done a listening comparison, if that's what you were going for, but we have done some stochastic comparisons in, uh, in the paper. So if that's what, what you were asking for. This is sort of the... But, but okay. to your ears, does it sound natural? Some. Some do. Some don't. Um, I think there's also some artistic value in them, but I think with the normal set of parameters we did an okay job of capturing the timbre. It, it is just the sustain part, so we have to keep that in mind too. Thank you. Is there any statistical dependence between the partials? If I understand correctly, maybe I missed something, is that you model the trajectories of each partial completely independent. Yes. That I would kind of assume that there might be some kind of covariance there. Mm -hmm. How about? Yes, there, there probably is, um, but we haven't uh, used it in this model. But it should be easily implementable um, by just not using um, the F0, um, but also using another overall Markov chain to track the fundamental frequency. So I think that could be implemented too in the future. That's a good idea. Mm. Uh, not just the F0, but also the partial amplitudes. Mm -hmm. I, be I believe that they vary quite strongly together, right? Sure. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Great talk. Um, so you have different Gaussians for different partials, right? Sorry? Uh, you have like different normal distributions uh, for, like for each partial? Uh, yes and no. Um, we are using normal dis distributions to uh, make up the, the skew normal distribution and they all have the same uh, the same standard deviation, mm -hmm. and the location parameter, which is the mean for the uh, standard normal one, is uh, always like the last state, as you can see in, in the slide. And the skew parameter is uh, calculated by, um, or is shaped by the distance from uh, the initial starting value. Mm -hmm. So uh, the location and the skew differ between each starting point. So have you experimented with multidimensional Gaussians? Uh, like, just to add to his point, like to put in covariance uh, into the system, like if you use, say, 3D Gaussians for like three harmonics at once, or um, like, have you experimented with that at all? No. Or like, <laughs> No, not yet, but that's a very good idea. Thank you. Okay. In your analysis of the original sound, is there any link between jitter and shimmer? Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Computer. When you analyze the original sound and you uh, get readings for jitter and shimmer across the sustain, is there any link between the two? As you oh. might expect if someone is bowing a string with a, a mm. finger. Um, that's, that's a good idea. I think that belongs to the... We haven't done it in the input phase and we haven't done it in the synthesize phase. Um, so that's, that's a good idea. Um, but we haven't done that. Okay, so thanks, Tim Tarek. And... Uh, <laughs>